the evolution of leadership. So you start off by identifying what people are good at. Mm -hmm. And then you start asking yourself a question, right? <laughs> what am I doing as a what manager to enable my team? And if you've ever run like Sun to the Art of War, I think there's like some really good lessons to be learned from there as a leader. Uh, and there's a chapter in there where he talks about what is the expectation for a leader. And I think it becomes very clear. If you read that, you read through history, what are the great like kind of leaders and managers done for their teams? Today, successful revenue leaders once started their careers just like you and I. They faced the challenges that their careers brought to them, they rose to the occasion, and became the leaders that we admire today. Join me as we explore the skills and stories that make a great leader with a pinch of vulnerability. Hello and welcome to Sales Therapy. I'm your host, Alper Yurder. Grab a chair, this is your exclusive invitation to the therapy room as leaders are gonna be sharing their career-defining moments, their secret tips and tricks in their arsenal towards success. And I promise we'll always end on a positive note. Today in the therapy chair, we have Jonathan Carbon, who is the CEO and co-founder of Maven AGI. Jonathan was previously global VP of CS and strategy at HubSpot, and he had very CS leadership roles at star brands like Sprinkler, Marketer, and Adobe. I've actually come across Jonathan in one of his podcasts on, on one of our good friends, Hyper Engage's podcast, and I said, this is the kind of person that I want to have the show too. And I think we're going to be sharing a lot of great stuff for uh, especially customer su success and, and sales teams today. We'll talk about his success, the joy, the pain, and the journey. Welcome to Sales Therapy, Jonathan. How are you feeling today? Feeling great. It's Friday. <laughs> it's been a busy week, but I'm excited because I'm going to get some time away from meetings so I can actually get through some of the stuff in my inbox. Uh, Wonderful. So is that your Friday? You're... Hopefully your beverage is not coffee. That's uh, that feels like the appropriate beverage for a Friday evening. In yeah, I will admit. I thought. I think on the Friday evenings I will make a cocktail going forward. This is just grapefruit juice, unfortunately. Okay, I'm but disappointed. I am. Me too. I'm very disappointed. And I think next time we meet, I will definitely make sure we both have a cocktail. I'll send it to your place. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So Jonathan, any good therapy starts with childhood and growing up years. Can you tell us a little bit about like where you are today? But before, where were you? Where did you grow up? How was your growing up experience and how it shaped the values yeah. that you have today in the business? Yeah, I think a couple of things that, uh, you know, jump out to me is looking back in retrospective. Um, you know, growing up, I was, uh, I loved reading. From a very young age, I read everything I could get my hands on. I spent a lot of time reading stories about you know people that did really interesting things, people that made a mark on history. The other thing that was really interesting is that I was very entrepreneurial as a child. Mm. And so I would do things like I grew up in Boston. And so in the summer times, uh, it's warm. We have beaches here. And so um, I would go and I would buy boxes of sunglasses. That come that's, that's not that's the first thing. People think about Boston, I think, beaches and the sun. <laughs> but, Boston but... <laughs> is amazing. It has beaches. Promote it, yes. Right. Well done. <laughs> yeah. The summertime is amazing. I think it's the best time to be in Boston. And so yeah. in the summertime, like, you know, I was like, grew up pretty close to the beach and you'd walk through there and you'd see all these people. Like, you're out there, you're laying on the beach, you don't have sunglasses. It was obviously neat here. The sun's blazing, it's hot. Uh, shining in your eyes and you're like, ah, there's a market here that needs to be met. And okay. You buy these glasses at wholesale. You have a box of like 20 sunglasses. Uh, they cost me probably $2 a pair. Go down to the beach and it's very easy for you to identify who your target audience was. It's the people <laughs> on the beach who didn't have sunglasses, right? <laughs> so you if only our lives fun. were, if only our lives were that easy right now with our ICPs and our products. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, around the ICP, I have a note on that, but uh, okay. I'll finish the story. We'll, teach, we'll touch on that. So yeah. You go to them and say, hey, you know, you look like you could use a pair of sunglasses. Now, how do you put, you know, a, a dollar value on saving your eyes and, you know, making sure you're not squinting into the sun? It's hard to do, but I was like, okay, let me start off at $10. I, got, I think I got up to $20 a pair. Mm -hmm. So I was like, that's how I made money as a kid. And then in the wintertime, I would go and like shovel people's walks because it's like very easy to identify who your customers are. So people didn't have their walks shoveled. Hey, give me 20 bucks. I'll shovel your walk for you. All right. 
So yeah, I think like identifying ICPs early on was something that was uh, interesting to me. And Geography defined the person you are and your businesses. In the summer, it was the glasses and in the winter, it was the snow of Boston. So Boston obviously helps you a lot. <laughs> I think it's about knowing where you're at and, uh, and making sure that you're, uh, you're utilizing it to the fullest extent. Okay. I was reading something the other day and someone said, the ICP, when you're early on in your journey, uh, it is aspirational, right? These are the people that we mm. think that we want to sell to. Mm. And then when you get further along in your journey, it's actually a retrospective. It's actually looking back and saying, who did we sell to? Uh, so I think that was the interesting statement around ICPs of, you know, is, is this really the people whose needs we're meeting and you don't know until later on. Does that apply? Like, has that been the story of your life when you look back at the examples that aspirational versus retrospective? Does that work really? I think, I think uh, setting goals is important, right? And that's mm. what aspirations are. If you're mm -hmm. looking at a certain target audience and you're saying, these are the people that we want to solve a problem for, you have to understand what that problem is. Mm -hmm. I think as, as, um, you know, as we got into the creation of Maven further on, you know, uh, obviously a bit further away from my childhood, that's exactly <laughs> what it was. It was like, yeah. hey, like there's a problem that I have, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and it goes back to childhood, right? Like I'm walking down the, down the beach and I want a pair of sunglasses because the sun is in my eyes. Yeah. I'll bet everyone else wants that as well. How do I know? Well, I'll go and ask them. Mm -hmm. You want a pair of sunglasses? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's not on a pair of sunglasses, of course. Yeah. And the same thing is true for now, right? So, um, you know, I spent the last four years at HubSpot um, as the global VP of CS there. And some of the challenges that I had was how do I engage with customers at scale? Mm -hmm. So at Cubspot over the last four years, you know, we grew incredibly fast. We were one of the five fastest growing B2B SaaS companies ever after a billion dollars in revenue. And the challenge that's associated with that is that you, you like Cubspot and many other companies grew in a very linear fashion. Mm -hmm. You're like, what the heck does that mean? Well, what it means is that as you add more customers, you add more people, right? And like, there's all these formulas in like the B2B SaaS world where it's like, if you want to grow with revenue by X, you add X amount of fake time. And so how do we break that and like non-linear growth? Well, in order to do that, you actually have to have um, some level of, of kind of understanding of how your customers want to be engaged with, what's important for you to get out of that, and what are the means that you have in order to do that? might be humans, it might be something else. It's good that we start talking about um, work and business um, straight in, but I'm going to keep you at the childhood and the first early years of career, actually, because the idea with sales therapy is like people look at you, your profile, they're like, wow, this guy, you know, Johnson, he achieved a lot. Now he's a founder, you know, ex HubSpot, ex this, that, and they, they have a certain idea of a leader in their minds. But what I want to share is that the journey until that leadership is not easy there's highs and lows you know we're all humans we all make mistakes we all learn from that so i guess my next question will be a little bit like can you tell us that career journey for you how did you end up with a maybe more of a customer success focus what were some career defining moments for you maybe let's hear that journey a little bit uh, it's funny because early on my first job out of school was i was writing code and so mm. um, you know journey from writing code to you know, kind of the customer experience aspect of it um, was something that definitely happened over time. And so, you know, I, I spent some time at a company called Unica, where I was working services team there, helping people to implement, um, you know, these marketing products. And then going from that, you know, I, I moved into kind of more sales related roles. So I spent some mm -hmm. time at WPP where I was in London. I definitely enjoyed my good, time. Good there. memories? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I was talking to someone about it the other day. Um, I lived in Camden for a little while, and that was great. Oh, nice. Um, How old were you when you lived in Camden? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, because that changes everything about the dynamics of Camden. <laughs> <laughs> I, old enough, Alfred, that I remember walking down the street after a, like a sales pitch. I had my backpack. Uh, and I was wearing a suit and I had my laptop in my backpack and it was like before, you know, like it was quite as like maybe gentrified as it is now. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, okay, this is like, a, people are looking at me and wondering what's in my backpack and Ooh. I'm wearing a suit and I'm the only person walking through Camden at that point wearing a suit. Okay. 
Okay. That gives me a ballpark idea of the times. Good. Thanks for that, Jonathan. <laughs> how long did you stay? How, how many years did you spend in London? Uh, I was in London um, and I traveled a bit because we were, we were going out, we were pitching some really fun companies on, you know, in the continent in Europe. And then I, uh, I ended up moving back to the U.S. when I joined a company called Omniture. You know what Omniture is, mm -hmm. but it was um, the uh, Adobe acquisition that helped move them into the SaaS business world. And so it was a market leader in the, um, the digital analytics space. Mm -hmm. And so I joined them and, uh, you know, my role was I owned accounts. I was responsible for, you know, uh, having them uh, use the product, making sure that they were uh, using it and also mm -hmm. buying more stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was kind of my introduction uh, to, you know, having like a sales role where I was responsible for, you know, like a, a number that I had to hit, you know, at WPP, of course, you know, we were constantly pitching new business, uh, but it was a little bit different. We didn't have products where like, you know, hey, imagine a world where we can make up these amazing marketing campaigns mm -hmm. for you or ad campaigns and having those conversations. Um, but at Omniture, I, you know, I met a great group of people and I'm still friends with many of them to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, of course, you know, Omniture was acquired by Adobe that created the foundation for um, their marketing cloud and spent five years there in a variety of different roles. So mm -hmm. uh, for me, I think, you know, there were some really um, formative things that I learned while I was at Adobe. The one is that, how do you build a great culture? And I think there's like, you know, when you get into cultures, right, there's a lot of different ways of looking at it. People think culture is like, um, you know, everyone's patting Fluffy. their shoulder and saying, yeah, great job. yeah exactly. But at Adobe, one of the things that literally stood out to me is like, hey, we had a great culture where we respected each other, but we also held each other to a high bar. Yeah. And so it's a performance culture, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You have high expectations of each other and you share that with each other. And so that was one of the places that I spent some time in. Really enjoyed that. Am I getting this right? Of course, over the last, you know, um, five years or so or even more, your focus has been a bit more on the customer su success side. But you've, you've obviously, or growing up in your career, it's been quite commercial. Like you, you come from a commercial mindset, closing, maybe selling more. And actually, especially now today, there's a fine line between what is sales, what is client success, in my opinion, because, you know, yeah. selling is helping and then client success is supposed to be, some of them carry a quota. Retention and upselling is all about, you know, commercial uh, outcomes as well. So for you, yep. do they stand in different places or are they, are they blended? How do you define sales and client success? You know, I, I think for me, uh, it, it, the sales begin with, can you help people solve a problem and problem mm -hmm. identification? Same mm -hmm. thing is true whether you're, you're doing it pre-sales or post-sales. And so if you're a new sales rep and you're trying to break into an account, you try to, it's a little, maybe a little bit harder to identify what the challenge is that you're trying to solve. You're trying to do it through like, you know, public information. You're going to read through their 10K. Uh, you're going to go like, you know, stock people's LinkedIn and what they're posting, look at their Twitter account. What are the things that are important to them? What are the jobs that they're posting for? To understand, hey, like where are they investing time and money? And so like the information is a little bit harder to track down mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning when you're getting into those accounts. But the mm -hmm. same thing is true, right? You're trying to identify, is there a problem that I can help you solve? If there is, then let's have a conversation about it. Am I the right person to help you solve that? And that's where you're, you know, you come in of like, do I have the right solution in order to be able to close the gap for you? Um, and then the same thing is true, you know, if you're working on the post sales side, where you know you might come in there and a customer has purchased a product, and the, your job is to make sure that they're actually deriving value from it. Are mm -hmm. they able to use it to the fullest extent of the, cap the capabilities? Are they able to actually close the gap on that problem that they had and the reason why they purchased in the first place? Mm -hmm. So that's like the first aspect of it. Are you yeah. getting value out of the product? The second is, what is the additional value you could be deriving from it? Yeah, which I think so is even more important. You're looking, yeah, exactly. On both sides of it, you're looking for, is there a business problem? How do I help you derive value? And if you focus on those things, you're going to be really great as a sales rep. You're going to be really great as a customer success rep, an account manager, um, or maybe a founder who is who is you know looking to identify their ICP. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll come to the founder journey in a minute, but before that, maybe let's dive into the specific learnings from each role in light of what you just explained of how you see the different roles, etc. So I want to get a bit of a 
And if we go, in, go into your earlier re leadership um, roles at Adobe or Sprinkler or, or even maybe a HubSpot, what did you learn at each stage? And how did that help your career? At, at Adobe, I think, you know, what was really helpful is what I mentioned earlier is like, mm -hmm. how do you create a performance oriented culture? Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, is that um, I think a lot of people, uh, are, you know, people are different. Everyone has different things that they're good at. A lot of people have different things that they like, they're fascinated by or interested in. And so, you know, for me, what I learned pretty early on is what are the strengths that people have? Mm -hmm. Some people are great communicators. Other people are great organizers. So identifying what those strengths are and helping them to play to those strengths while taking recourse to supplement the areas they might be weakest in. Mm -hmm. And so I think if, you know, you look at like a sports team, you know, you tend to focus on if you have, you know, you're in London, so we'll talk about soccer for a second <laughs> or uh, football. Football, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, if you have a great striker, um, you're going to focus on using that striker to like, you know, penetrate into the other side of the field and to put pressure on their goalie. You're not going to drop that striker back into defense. Like, that's not what they're good at. So, you know, if you're dropping that striker back and you're like making them a midfielder or you're making them a defenseman, they're not going to do very well. And you look at that person and you're like, why aren't you a better defender? Because that's not what they're good at. Mm -hmm. and so if you can identify, hey, what are people good at? And play Let's to their strengths. You yeah, where you can optimize your skills that you possess. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's part of like being a leader. It's really difficult because, especially as a founder, but even in a startup environment, um, very resource constrained. So you're trying to do a lot of things, and sometimes you put pressure. Um, you know, you expect everything from everybody, but in an ideal world, you have to focus on the strengths and like you know, improve on them and, and make sure that people are delivering um, based on those strengths, I think. Um, you know, Alfred, it's it's not just startups that are that way. It's, you know, yeah. and that was the thing that I, I took away from my journey at, at Adobe, right, where I had this group of incredibly talent. But, you know, you might look at them and say, well, there's a gap here and there's a gap there. And it's like, this is thing you could do better. Yeah, yeah, we all have things we could do better. But if you focus on the thing that you're good at, then you're going to see some pretty amazing results. And I think for a lot of leaders, they struggle with that. Yeah, say, yeah hey, it's hard. Why is this person more like me? I want them <laughs> to have great like, written communication skills and great yeah. verbal communication skills. With maybe like their real talent is like on the technical side or it's yeah. in organizing thing, or it's in, you know, actually being able to like, uh, you know, help customers keep track of yeah. where they're at. I will admit, even after 15 years of supposedly leadership uh, journey, I think I need a nudge sometimes on that, you know, like, so every month I try to, you know, shake myself and like, see what, what am I asking of people? And is that in line with, you know, what they're delivering, what they're good at delivering, etc. Yeah, trying to create mini me's is definitely not not great. But sometimes we all f fall into that trap. The evolution of leadership. So you start off by identifying what people are good at. Mm -hmm. And then you start asking yourself a question, right? <laughs> what am I doing as a what manager to enable my team? And if you've ever run like Sun to the Art of War, I think there's like some really good lessons to be learned from there as a leader. Uh, and there's a chapter in there where he talks about what is the expectation for a leader. And I think it becomes very clear. If you read that, you read through history, what are the great like kind of leaders and managers done for their teams? There's like three things that they've done. The first thing is, is that you say, Okay, you know, you make it very clear what you're asking them to do. And so you set a goal. And I think the problem that a lot of companies uh, have is that they, they have a bunch of goals. You're like, let's do this, this, and this. And maybe this, this, and this. If you have a single goal that everyone is fixated on, it becomes incredibly powerful for you as a leadership team to hold people accountable for it and say, everything we do has to lead us further along towards this goal. And so you as a leader say, okay, great. I'm asking you to hit this goal. My job is, do you have the tools that you need in order to be able to achieve this goal? Have I given you the training on how to use those tools to be able to achieve this goal? If so, then you have the three things that are required in order for you to be able to pursue that. And so I think if you can, if you can achieve that as a leader, you're doing the right thing and the thing that you're supposed to be doing. And I think a lot of people get confused by other things like, where should I be spending my time? How do I lead all that other stuff? Focus on those three things and you'll be well on your path. Is that what you learned to focus on at HubSpot? 
I think that's something that I've, I've, I've learned over a period of time. Um, you mm. know, HubSpot was certainly an area where, you know, I had a team that was, uh, I think it was almost a thousand people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I, I learned to, um, you know, how do I, how do I make sure that I have uh, clear communication across my entire organization? It was certainly an evolution. Um, you know, <laughs> we went from uh, about 2000 people to about 7,700 people while I was there. My team went from, I think it was about 238 people when I first started. Um, and so it, it grew rapidly. And so, you know, making sure that we had the right infrastructure to be able to support uh, our ongoing growth. Um, I don't think we had it right 100% of the time, yeah. but what we learned is like where the gaps were and how we could, uh, we could evolve there. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's you know, the continual improvement. Uh, and I think one of the things that's really important as you continue to grow in terms of the size of your team is actually being able to make sure that you're bringing everyone along for the journey. Like we shouldn't be as leaders kind of, you know, sitting in a room making those decisions by ourselves. The people who are going to give you the most insights in terms of customers are going to be the people who are closest to them, who interact with them on a daily basis. So some of the things that I learned along the way was how do I include them in my planning cycles? So at HubSpot, we used to go through an annual planning cycle and we would start that at the beginning of the year. What we do is we would go to our, our you know, frontline reps and we'd say, what are the things we could be doing better, differently in order for us to continue to move towards the goal we had? And we had a really high revenue retention target that we were trying to hit uh, over our three-year journey. And we took step functions every year to get there. And so we'd say, hey, this is our goal for the next year. What are the things that we need to do in order to achieve that? Mm-hmm. And they'll tell you when you're doing things that don't make sense, right? Yeah. You're like, why do I have to put data into this thing and this thing and this thing? That doesn't make sense. And you're like, you're right. It doesn't make sense. Um, or why am I like doing multiple data entries? And why am I using this system for forecasting, but it's really not good. Or, you know, we really should be spending more time talking to customers. That's where they get real value. Great. Now your job is to take that information and then continue to kind of evolve it to the point where you can systematize it, giving people the things that they need in order to be able to hit the objectives. Yeah, because we're already talking about some of those very pre- practical things from your experience. Um, when Before coming to the podcast, I generally try to get some questions from some of our users, our own users, because a lot of them sure. are customer success and salespeople. And also from my team, <laughs> our own customer success team, our okay. founder, etc. So I want to do a little bit of a rapid fire s- session, if you don't mind. You know, it will be a few very real questions that people are struggling with from your world. And, you know, we try to do it in like a m- minute or whatever. So one thing that my co-founder especially was very interested in this question. How did you approach self serve versus handheld onboarding at HubSpot? No, it's a, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, and so we evolve over time. Uh, the first thing that we realized is that um, having a bespoke onboarding experience is not something mm. that works for everyone. Um, you have customers who learn in different forms. And so for a lot of people, like, you know, there's the, they said, hey, you know, uh, I don't necessarily need to have someone holding my hand throughout the entire process. Give me the information and I can do it for myself. Yeah. So what you find is there's three categories of customers. There's customers who want to self-serve. There's customers who are like, I want to self-serve, but I need validation and I'm doing it correctly because this is mission critical to my business. The third type of customer is like, this is so important to my business. It has to be done right. I don't have the time, energy, effort to train myself on how to do it. And I don't have the knowledge. So I want someone to do it for me. Love it. So those are the three types of customers. And if you use those three types of customers as kind of your basis for how you're creating your onboarding or your success engagement strategy, it'll be really helpful for you. That is gold right there. And I don't know even if people look at those ty- like, I'm not even sure if especially as startups, people have that defined typology, you know, per customer, which yeah. when you put it that way, it's super clear what needs to be done. Thank you for that. One other one. What's the main criteria other than the deal size to determine how much human touch should there be in an onboarding process? (laughs) And this person said asking for a friend. (laughs) Um, The right amount of human touch is is defined by your, by, you know, kind of your product, right? Mm -hmm. It's like how you're designing your product and, and what's required from a user perspective. And so what you're, what you'll find is that if you're looking at your telemetry data, your customers are going to tell you, Hey, your onboarding isn't very good in certain areas, but I'm never engaging with certain parts of it. 
Now, of course, you have to understand what those customers use cases are and make sure your product is meeting those needs. But like you start getting into your product data, it tells you a lot about your onboarding. Excellent. Thanks for that. Two more of these. One is being a customer success leader at HubSpot. What were some of the issues you were dealing with at the time and what did you learn? I think we started alluding to this a little bit, but maybe like something that was a bit, let's say, rather painful to learn. When I was at HubSpot, we were going through one of those, those periods of incredible growth. Mm -hmm. And so hiring was, was probably the most challenging thing that we had uh, to deal with there uh, from uh, making sure that we were serving our customers appropriately. So you know, first is like actually being clear about what we were hiring for. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we did a bunch of work on like, hey, what are the people who are most successful as a CSM in terms of driving revenue retention? And so once we identified what are the skills that we need to hire for, uh, we said, okay, what are the ones that we're going to train people for? And once you have clarity on both of those, we were able to make sure that we were hiring the right people to make them to help them be successful in those roles. Uh, I think for a lot of people, you know, they like, hey, you know, this person, you hired them and they're just not good at their job. And usually it's actually you weren't very good at hiring. You didn't define what the criteria was that you needed for success in that role. Yeah. You didn't understand what are the traits that people had to, needed to have in order to be successful in that role. And then you didn't say, what are the things that we were able to train people on that we're willing to train people on in order to make them successful? I think for us at the end of the day, we wanted to make the people who came in the door successful, we wanted people who are on the team to be successful. And so uh, we continued to iterate on making, and how we could do that. Mm -hmm. Transitioning from HubSpot, now obviously you're the founder of an early stage startup um, at Maiden. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about what the product is about, what it stands for, how does it combine your values? And actually, I want to combine it with one question again from a startup um, founder, I believe. How can early stage companies punch about their weight, leverage client success to drive further revenue? So maybe first a little bit about Maven. Um, yep. The origin of Maven was because some of the challenges that I had while I was at HubSpot around scaling in a nonlinear fashion. Mm -hmm. um, we had an amazing CFO at, at uh, HubSpot, Kate Buecher. Um, and she the focused on the and emphasized why it was important you grow in a nonlinear fashion. The challenge for me is I didn't have the systems that were required in order for me to be able to engage customers at scale, having humans involved. And so at the same time, one of my good friends, Eugene Mann, was leading the applied ML team at Stripe. Uh, he previously was at Google News, and he was coming to me and saying, hey, I'm trying to tackle the same challenge for the Stripe team here. I, what are you guys doing differently at HubSpot? Like, can I learn from you? And another friend of mine who was at, he, he had built the Google News team from zero to a billion users was chatting with us around what the support experience was like for those users. And so, you know, you're talking about things that are scaling massively. I mean, a billion users, that's one seventh of the world's population. How do you support think, people like that? How do you do it in a very personalized manner? Mm -hmm. And what we found out is that people were, nobody across the board was doing a very good job of it. I think it's after this pitch, we're, we're all dying for, we're like, okay, we're going to buy the product, Jonathan, tell us now. <laughs> <laughs> I think the buildup was so long. I'm like, okay, like, wh how am I going to solve this now? Tell me, tell me. <laughs> but it's a, the, the, the truth is, it's a problem that we all have, right? Like how yeah. do you support customers at scale? And so what we, what we've, we realized is that technology didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. And so we've actually built AI agents for the enterprise using generative AI um, for, so, you know, every answer is bespoke for that customer. Um, and so what we're finding is we're able to help companies uh, create that nonlinear growth. We're saving people 80% of their customer support cost uh, while delivering a better experience to their users. And so okay. that's the thing that we've been focused on. And so you asked me, how am I uh, drinking my own champagne? Yeah. Yes, well, cool aid. Creating a great experience. Yeah. Great experience. Creating a uh, great experience for our customers and then um, actually investing in, in customer success. So we yeah. recently put out something. We're hiring our first customer success manager, which is amazing. Oh, well we're done. Wonderful. For that role. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Um, we actually hired our, I've been in sales forever and I, I've always been a sales leader and then customer success, etc. came into play. Uh, and then I learned the role of customer success a bit better. But we at Flow hired our customer success person first before we hire another salesperson. Because for our products, right. um, I think that typology works really well. A lot of for a lot of people, it's very intuitive. 
But for a lot of people, I think they're looking for best practice that, you know, you had two points about the job of uh, CS. Um, it's like a helping and then showing the value actually, because somebody buys the product, not just to solve something, but they're looking for a best practice, how to do things better, you know, and the job of client success is, I think, to show like the full extent of things, the full extent of possibilities, how others are using it. Um, I don't know if you agree with that, but for that, I think the CS role today, especially in this economic environment, is so much more important than it's ever been, I feel like. I think the, the way that you sell and service customers is really important. And I think that's something that you know we, we, we felt very strong about at HubSpot. The way that you sell to people uh, for us at Maven is uh, like predicated on value. Mm -hmm. Can we solve a problem for you? Can we create value for you? Mm -hmm. And the way that you service customers should be the same way that you sell. Are we creating value? And how, are we continuing to you know, help you solve the problem that you purchased uh, our product for? So uh, I think, I think you know, if your focus is on helping people solve problems, you'll find a market for your product. I love that. Absolutely. And I've also seen that you're mentoring some companies at Techstars, if I'm not wrong, um, for a couple of years. Like, what's the most common CS pitfall those startups fall into or, or every company falls into? I think, um, I think the tendency as a founder is to focus on what's the most immediate problem that you have in front of you. Hmm. So for most companies that are, you know, starting from the ground up, it's like, how do I get my first customer? How do I assign them to a contract? And then you're like, great, I'm going to think about, you know, the value that I'm creating for them down the road when it comes around to renewal. In the world that we live in, where people are signing up for subscription products, yeah. it's not just about, hey, I'm going to focus on value when you're, you know, re-signing yeah. or you're re upping the contract. It has to be continuous. Of course. So thinking very uh, strategically about your customer journey, what's the experience you're delivering to them at every step of that journey is going to be really important for you as a, as a large company or you as the founder of a startup. And this brings me nicely to our final section where, where I'm going to throw a few keywords at you and like get your immediate reaction or response or experience, whatever you want to share about them. So when I say, um, how do you keep customer churn at bay? By delivering value. Excellent. I'm going to say churn, just churn. Bad. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> Love that. Retention. Value. Okay, Jonathan, the third answer has to be something other than value. People are going to be looking for like a super specific, I guess, magic potion from you. Okay, so I'm going to, that's why I'm going to go with, do you have a magic potion for customer success? And I think it's going to be value. It should be value, but I'm going to give you something a little bit different. Give me a little bit different, you know, yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to give you the long-winded answer on this one, Alper. Perfect. Um, customer success has to be intentional. And so what's required in order for you to make your customers successful is for you to invest your time and money into making sure that you're setting them up for success. So uh, my answer is like invest. Make that investment. I love that. Invest. Oh, yes. But a lot of these people listening are going to be like, I don't have the money to invest. I don't have the resources. Yes, of course I want to do, but making as much as possible with as little as possible, I think is a very common thing that I hear from leaders today on a side note. I don't know. Do what, you hear the same? Is you're, going to invest, you're going to invest, you're either going to invest time or money in it. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you wait until your customers are churning to invest your time, mm -hmm. then you'll have wasted you know, the CAC that you spent on acquiring that customer. Excellent. Um, and so as you start getting into funding as like a startup founder or, you know, a, a senior executive at a, at a company, like you care a lot about CAC and LTV. Uh, you start looking at churn numbers at you know, publicly traded companies, and those are something that your investors look at very closely. So uh, if your investors care about them, you probably should as well. Care them. Yeah, I love that. Definitely. I think this will be one of the shorts of, of, of this podcast because... I completely agree with that. Can I ask one or two more of those? Or have you had yeah, enough? Of course. Okay, excellent. No, no, good. Okay. Uh, yeah, I like when, when people ask me on a podcast, like very short, 
um, questions. I love it too. Like it makes me also reflect on my past. What signals do you look for retention? I think I think like you know, there's a, there's a couple of different ways you do that. Uh, you know, one is a customer health score, and your inputs to that customer health score become really important. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, for for like different companies, like uh, you know, people have different use cases of why you use their product. So if you understand what are the fundamental use cases for our products, what are the metrics associated with it from a product usage perspective, tying those together and giving your team visibility to those, it's going to be really important. In making sure that people are getting value out of your product. You know, oh, yeah. in HubSpot's case, it might have been, hey, you know, uh, you purchased our marketing hub. Are you sending emails? Uh, are they taking meaningful actions in your product? If they are, the likelihood for them to stick around is uh, fairly significant. Understand what those actions are associated with those use case. Understand the metrics associated with them. And you'll be well on your way to knowing when customers are uh, ready to expand or ready to churn. Excellent. What were your gold star KPIs when you were at HubSpot? What kind of North Star uh, KPIs can client successfully just establish for themselves, do you think? Our North Star was revenue retention. And so going back to our, the beginning of this conversation, we talked about uh, having a, a kind of a single metric that you're asking the company and your team to move towards. Our North Star is revenue retention. We mm-hmm. cared about making sure customers were getting value out of the product and they were continuing to expand. And so if you're getting value out of it, you're going to be growing. If you're, you know, you're getting value out of uh, a marketing product, it means you're landing more customers and you're going to like go land more customers. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so, um, Revenue retention is a really good understanding of whether you're creating value for your customers. Mm-hmm. And what were some leading indicators of that revenue? For example, I guess this health score that you mentioned could be one. Um, what, what other indicators? Like if I'm sitting, I'm the customer success leader of a, let's say, startup or scale up. Yep. And I'm trying to create as much predictability as possible or, you know, visibility as possible into the future. What sort of things that I should bear in mind? Um, the first is you mentioned leading indicators. One of my favorite phrases, um, one of the first books that I asked my team to read at HubSpot was something called The Four Disciplines of Execution. Mm-hmm. And it talks a lot about how you derive leading indicators. Uh, for a lot of people, we use the phrase leading indicators to indicate a metric that's not actually leading. And so, <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that we looked at is what's the number of opportunities that are created? Uh, from the engagements that we have with our team. And so the outcome is the number of opportunities that are created with our existing customers, but the leading indicator is actually engagement. You can't yeah. create opportunities if you don't talk to your customers. And so that was one of the things that we focused on. Are we talking to our customers on a consistent basis? Love it. Who should be in charge of extensions and upsells and does it differ by you know, investment stage or employee numbers or any, anything like that? I think it, it actually varies uh, even more wildly than just like your stage as a company. I think it comes yeah. down to your leadership. Hmm. Um, you know, so for me, my focus was was really on delivering value to customers. And I associate uh, a product usage, adoption and growth with value, mm-hmm. as you may have picked up during this conversation. <laughs> so I, I do think that's the right metric for yeah, customer success. Yeah, clearly. Yeah. A lot of people struggle with it. They're like, hey, you know what customer success, it's all about product usage. No. You know, how do you know if your product is useful? People are, you know, people have to use it. They have to pay you for it. And they have to, like, continue to expand with it. Uh, and so that's that's how I, how I judge value creation uh, and usability. Love it. Okay, this has been a great conversation. And as I, as I start wrapping up, um, Jonathan, anything that I should have asked you that I haven't asked? Um, you can always ask more details around Maven because I can talk about that for hours out for, I don't know if we fit it all into this podcast. No, we, I think this will be one of many podcasts we'll do together. <laughs> I'm hoping no, but, um, I'm, I'm very intrigued because I think especially the pitch, the build up was great. And at that point I was like, okay, I think I'm going to go and give this thing a go yeah, because yeah, he's yeah. talking about it in a really nice, interesting way. Another interesting thing for me is like, we talk about AI in, in the show and every, every day I, it, it becomes a bit of a creepy, cringy word for me. And I haven't seen an AI, like the, the value proposition is really crazy there. Like if an AI is able to do customer success or customer support or product support, 
in a way that humans are doing. That is quite... I'm a little scared by that. At the same time, I'm very intrigued by that. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. I think there's a lot of concern by people of like, you know, hey, is, you know, generative AI going to take my job? And I think when you look at, you know, there you of, go. Uh, when you look at history, right, it tells us the answer. Any kind of, you know, uh, evolution of technology has actually expanded the expense. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you heard the same thing and we were coming out with, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Looms, right? Back during the Industrial Revolution. Hey, like, we're going to take the jobs from all the weavers. It didn't take the jobs. Didn't, it actually yeah. made people, um, you know, increase their output and uh, made a whole lot of jobs for a lot of people. So uh, mm. I'm really excited about the capabilities of generative AI on improving customer experience. I love that. You know, the person who would be actually a lot of questions came from him today, my co-founder. He's a fourth time founder and he's a co uh, he's our product guy, actually. He's the pro product man. And now he's doing a bit of client success support as well. And a few of the questions actually came from him. I think he would love, absolutely love a chat with you, especially around what you're building. Um, before we finish, any closing remarks? No, oh, man. Uh, Albert, it's been great to chat with you. I love talking about customer success, startups, uh, generative AI. So appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. My super pleasure. And I'm definitely keen to keep this conversation going. I think we'll have some really good comments on this episode. Um, and I will definitely push you to keep sharing the gold with our audience in the future. I'm going to cut us on time, cut it in the clock, just like any good therapist would which today, again, I failed to be a good therapist. And actually, I have gone over time because it was a great chat. So I thank you very much for that, Jonathan. That's going to be a wrap on this episode of Sales Therapy. If you enjoy the show, um, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube or Spotify. And many, many thanks to my uh, dear guest, Jonathan Corbin, for being with us today. See you on the next episode. Bye.